Uh, today's speaker for Engineering Week is Manuel Barroso, and he's with the Quincy Center for Innovation in his positive uh, business consulting group. Um, he has a long history uh, with IBM, Price Waterhouse Coopers, um, very knowledgeable person, and I hope you enjoyed the talk today. Manuel. Thank you, Richard, for the invitation, and I appreciate that. I'm happy to be here at uh, Quincy College. Uh, Manuel Barroso, I have been doing a consulting in uh, engineering and uh, enterprise uh, businesses almost for 30 years now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just let me know. I'm going to talk today about why, why engineers uh, always get the fun jobs. And, uh, so as uh, Richard mentioned, part of my experience, I was partnered before in IBM and a principal in PricewaterhouseCoopers, having projects in uh, all the continents but one. I haven't been in Antarctica yet, but uh, get there. Uh, and in helping the global companies uh, to come to latest technology. Okay. Okay. Uh, so who are engineers? It's a lot of people like you, like are very curious on things to make life easier, right? Most of the engineers get that remote control. Why? You are listening to one push the button, right? So you start creating things to make life easier for you and for the big guy. So. Uh, so they have invited, invented uh, cell phones, TVs, remote controls, the TV printer, printers you see in the back. Uh, so you have many other ideas of things that you would like to see invented that are not there yet. I'm going to try to make this more interactive, please. But you can tell me some things that you will invent. Let's see. Okay. Tools. Tools, okay. I want flying cars. A flying cars. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah, no, that's good. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully after this session. Flying shoes. Flying shoes, yeah, why not? Okay, so probably after this session, maybe you come with some other ideas, but actually, those are very good ideas. Let's move on to the next one, please. So, a quick has heard about blockchain. Please raise a hand who has heard about blockchain. Okay, so we're gonna talk about it. Let's go next one, please. What about AI? What does AI stand for? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, all right. Um, and IoT. Let's get about IoT. Uh, Internet of Things. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that. Uh, machine learning. Okay, you hear about machine learning? Right. So, and then, uh, then lastly, we want to talk a little bit about um, con uh, connective uh, robotics. So that's when I talk about how they merge robotics and artificial intelligence. Okay, so you may be familiar with the engineering process today. So let's think about it, you know, you guys, some of you are going to invent something. Some of you maybe want to use, but maybe after this one, first thing is just start emoying, right? Like now, let's start brainstorming. So, People need flying cars, flying, cars. flying shoes. You know? <laughs> yeah, so then they say, why? You know, it's getting very, you know, they say about 2030, about 65% of the uh, human population will live in cities. You know, there are cities in, in, in China that were about 20,000 people 25 years back. Now there are 13 million people in those cities. So the, the way they are growing and that we are growing, you can see the traffic in 93, trying right, to get to the city, a pick up. One. So you have a flying car, <laughs> that would be marvelous. So we start imagining, then we research. How do I make it happen, right? Okay, that's a great idea, but now how do I make it real? Then we go, uh, we gotta make a plan, what people we need to do to make it done. Funding, knowledge, people then get done. Then we start creating. Do you think the first time we try something, it works? Not right, for sure. Right? Other than Mozart, nobody else works on the first time, right? Everybody has to create, test, prototype and ma many times that the league works. Even Google, Google took like a 25 years before they actually really became something. I remember when, uh, uh, that time when I was in IBM, there was a time I said, oh, there's Google, uh, we started using that for search, just a search engine. This one, there, oh, there is Google, let's trade them as a small company to see how we can help. And rather than became a medium-sized company, I said, oh, actually, let's put that in a bank so we can actually start selling the servers and other things. And now they're way bigger than IBM. So that's how things go. So, 
and then we start improving. So they, they didn't give up, they just keep improving until you are big. Now, and then we create positive things. When you create all this and you keep in the loop, and, but you don't get tired about it. You, just, you maybe need to engage additional people to get these creations. So now, we start talking about artificial intelligence. So what is it? It involves machines that can do things um, similar to what humans can do. Some of them, that, I mean, we, in the past, they were hundreds of lines of programming code, for example, like expert systems. Okay, you want to go to a doctor or you want to find out what you have, you know, start asking questions about it. Or you want to go to a, visit a city, say, based on what you like, make you some recommendations, right? That was the early stages. But really, it's about learning. Just imagine that a, a self-driving car, a few years back, they start doing prototypes. You have in a control environment where you can drive the car, right? It's a self-driving car because it's, everything is controlled, you know, it's got a GPS. And, but when you go on the road, when, you know, somebody just go across the street, a dog gets out of the, you know, the leash, and then a pothole, and all that, you know, it's difficult to program that. You have to learn how to react to that. And by, by the way, you are in a, a self-driving car, and you find there is a pothole here, guess what? You put that in the cloud, and all the other cars that are self-driving, now they know there is a pothole there. So next one already knows about it. So you are driving as a person, the first one hits, the second one hits, the third one hits, because you are not communicating to other people. And with artificial intelligence and self-driving automatic autonomous cars, they will communicate, and they know about it, they learn about it. So chess play. You know, there was a time that people was beating the machines, right? Then the machines start learning, and now, I think people, so, now people cannot, uh, it's difficult to be teaching now, because they keep learning, but no, they don't forget about things. They just keep learning about many other uh, players. Uh, and now how to recognize objects. <coughs> you know there is a you know, warm weather outside. What is it like on? So machine will, maybe you forgot to turn it off in your car house, and the machine is still running, right? But uh, with artificial intelligence, say, it's outside, it's hot. What is it? Keep it running. Shoot it down. It learns about it. Make it Okay. So now, there are two types of artificial intelligence. One is about application-driven and general. Application-driven are the ones that are very specific for something. For example, a machine that is ready to play uh, chess, or a machine that is ready for uh, autonomous driving. So there are different types of uh, very dedicated artificial intelligence. And there are the generic ones. There are the ones, the new generation of artificial intelligence, where, they, for example, someone, someone that is ready for chess, now they want to be able to learn checkers without nobody teaching that machine how to do it. Other things, these generalized AIs, for example, are some that can be, many of the Google uh, Droid telephones now, they have one of those. This is a new AG, it's an uh, application called uh, Naja, and that application is for general artificial intelligence. Now, many Droid telephones are putting that in, inside your phones so they can learn about you. But now, the side than that is that they're going to keep in private cloud so they don't put that in a general cloud. But they learn about you. So they learn that you like to go r running in a sunny day or maybe you like running in a snow day. And they start making recommendations about your habits. What you do, what you like to buy because everything is linked. And they start making recommendations about you. So it, it maybe like the, in the, in the phone knows about you that you don't like to go in the highway. So we recommend two ways to go to different places, not using the highway, because you don't like that. So every time it recommends you to the highway, you say, no, change me routes. So next time it doesn't recommend you that. So it's keep learning about you. So those ones are becoming more uh, powerful and very interesting, those uh, general uh, solutions. Uh, let's move on. Uh, now, what's the difference between artificial intelligence, mature learning, deep learning? So there are many different terms that some people just change, use them interchangeable, but uh, actually there are some differences. In general, all of it is artificial intelligence. Just, there are two ways to do it. Either you can teach a machine how to do it, programming thousands and millions of lines, or you can let machine to learn about it. So when you use machine learning, you can let machines learn about this. They can self-train, and how they train based on data. For example, how you, can you guys tell me how, or you, are you at home, right? Can you tell me how you teach a baby what is a dog and a cat? Yeah, you show them, you 
describe them, you expose them? Exactly, exactly. I, I have a, a nephew that he's three years old. I remember when he, he everything was a dog, right? A yeah. cat, and everything, everything was a dog. Right? And everything in the house, flying was a, was a bear, everything. So, and then he, by you showing him different animals, he learns, okay, now, now it is a cat, now this is a dog, now this is a, you know, a lion or whatever, but he started learning by showing him different pictures and different examples or something. That's exactly what machines are. So they learn by examples. When you, they present to you pictures, and you say, oh, I was speaking to Richard, when you put in your phone, and then when you see, I want to show my favorites, right? You don't tell, you know, the, I want these people in my phone. Automatically, if I see all the pictures you take, say, oh, this is a common people that comes in most of the pictures. I automatically select them. And, and we show you, confirm that this person is there, and say, oh, actually, no, it's not that person. You are, telling, you are teaching that computer, say, oh, that is not that him. So I know that now the eyes are a little bit clearer than this. And it could be different perspective, but it keeps learning about it. And guess what? Some, well, for example, something I don't do, I don't put the names on the pictures. Guess what? When you go into the cloud, people know who's that person, right? So, but other people may do that. So when you start tagging, you are really teaching the computer to learn about it. So that's why you're teaching, and then keep learning about it. And now in the future, they know, oh, by the way, you know, when you look for somebody in Google, say, images, comes all the people that look like, because either looks I like, or they are somebody who already tagged them. There. So that's how they learn, but it's about everything, about as medicine, well, DNA, it's all, all the similarities, and say, okay, all this person with these characteristics are propensed to diabetics. Why? Because it's millions of records that have shown that. And that's how you scientific and artificial intelligence. Deep learning. Now, what's called deep learning is just multiple layers about it. You know, for example, the layer about the curves on the face, the curves in between the eyes, and those many things. So you put all these, overlap all these layers, and when you put all those together, say, okay, that particular combination of layers is what actually Manuel's face looks like. It's not, Richard is not, it's just because all these layers together makes a different pattern than somebody else. Okay. What are the trends? So they say, people say, ah, artificial intelligence is going to take away jobs. No, I, I think it's opposite. That will have to create about, by, by 2025, a net 2 million more jobs than new jobs. Certainly some jobs going to go away. Uh, other new jobs gonna come. Guess what? The idea that Richard has, and a lot of people here in Quincy College, is about you guys get ready today for what is coming, you are part of those jobs. You get ready for what was a few years back, you're not part of those jobs. So that's the important thing of getting uh, starting up today, to get, you know, what is all this technology, all this uh, engineering is coming, is to be take advantage of all this huge growth. And uh, think about that. Uh, there's a conference in uh, April 20. 3rd to 25 in Boston about artificial intelligence. Uh, this is a web link, you may take a look at it. I think it's a discount for uh, students um, and professors. Okay, so artificial intelligence applied, many things, you know. Automotive, can be in self-driving cars, for sure. And you, have you guys seen the, the one from Google that goes around in Boston? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's kind of cold, isn't it? Then, right sharing with apps like Uber, and lift ways. When you look at it, you look for your, it's a bunch of things that are coming there, right? They show you where they are, and they're learning about your habits and present the type of drivers you most likely know, like. Because when you provide feedback, you say which drivers you like, with, and they know which ones match with you. Education, adapt learning. So today is very traditional learning, but you know how you really adapt. Based on every student, every person has a different way to learn. And the machines keep learning about you. So you like to learn in the night, probably send some more, more typical type of content at night or in the morning, it's a different way you learn. You have more personal, more focus on examples, it will show you more examples of exercises versus more readings. Depends on your habit, the important thing is you achieve the knowledge. It will adjust the way you learn based on your feedback and your performance and, and your emotions. Different, it is it's very difficult today is understand emotions, right? So computers say, well, the difference between a ro uh, robot and a person are emotions. Guess what? That is probably not no longer true. Now, computers are learning to understand emotions as well. And then they can recognize your emotion and react to those emotions. Or retail, predict what you're going to buy. Uh, when you go to a store and you look what you're looking for, you're likely going to come, right? But what's happening with Whole Foods? Whole Foods was doing great, but then Amazon came and pushes it. 
try to put all their algorithms to optimize the inventory level, and guess what? It ran out of things because they didn't put all this portion in place. So that, you know, they were trying to optimize so much, but without the proper intelligence behind it. And then people come in there and didn't find what they're looking for, and they start losing clients, and then it could have to rebuff it back again. So just you change things gotta be thoughtful how you change them. Uh, customer care, like chatbots. Have you go in, in a customer care where you start interacting, and then uh, when you interact, it looks like a, it pop up a chat, and you say you ask him, but it looks like it's a person, but really it's not a person. It's a chatbot, and it's a moment that doesn't know the answer. It's when it actually reaches to a a customer care person behind it. So in, in that moment, you are saving about these common questions that rather than paying $5 a minute for somebody that is picking up the phone, the chatbot is taking care of it. And instead of you waiting 20 minutes online, maybe you resolve your problem. Just with a chatbot, you don't have to call. But then if you need help, then you, more people is available to help you. So that's that way, for example, in customer care. Robotics, uh, some include artificial intelligence we need to, to interact with us. We wanna talk about it a few minutes. From now, now who has used Siri or Alexa or uh, Google Home? Tell you one example. Some how do you use it? I use Alexa and I use Google Home. I prefer Google Home because she's smarter than Alexa. Um, reordering things, checking the time, checking the weather, turning off the lights, um, turning on the lights. Okay, anyway. you good? Um, Alexa, I use it for music and searching for information about the weather and whatnot. Right, yeah, exactly. And that's all about, it's artificial intelligence, right? How do you recognize your voice patterns? How do you know that I'm saying, talking about weather? I know whether I can do that or whether not. It's weather, you know, weather science. So those kind of things, it's helped to understand um, linguistics and understand, and it also works in different languages. It's not, you gotta pick up your language right away. So what you're talking about, and what the context, and then based on that, provide answers. Uh, then healthcare, and these are health customers to get a rate uh, treatment faster. There's a company called DeepMind that is doing that very heavily, and actually Google is partnering with them as well. It's, it's helping, just imagine that Google hired them to help them to, to optimize the way how they use air conditioning in their data centers, yeah. and they have reduced 40% of the usage. So this, so they really is about learning and providing real-time feedback and learning about it. So they are using that to also help in, in the medicine area, how to improve and diagnose faster. And some uh, hospitals in New York are starting to do that. So actually people start talking to a computer, start resolving issues. Uh, if they go, doesn't get a research result, get to a person that is not in the hospital, remotely. Get, instead of waiting for hours in the, in the emergency room, they get resolved the situation, either through a robot or to a remote uh, health provider. And then if, if, as a matter of fact, it's needed, it's routed immediately to a I can see that on site. So that helps to reduce the number of waiting time in the emergency rooms as well as prioritize who really needs more help. Now, so that's about the artificial intelligence. Any questions about it? It sounds like a lot of the applications you're using for arti artificial intelligence can use a lot of um, data analytics types of tools. Yes. And how valuable do you think background in data analytics is if you want to talk about it? It's very valuable. They actually they converge at some point. That is very, very it, you know, that, analy that analytics helps a lot. You know, understanding the models of data that uh, actually help you to shape the artificial intelligence as well. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a conversion. Any comments or questions? Okay. Now we're talking Internet of Things, and also that's also again together with uh, is part of input that will be used for artificial intelligence. It's used for data mining as well as all the uh, big data and as well data analytics. So all this information that you are collected across many places, uh, connected any device, you know, with any other device, and also with you. But like for example, uh, we already talked about Alexa, how you turn on the lights, right? You are connecting a device to a device. If you are driving and you are approaching a, a traffic light, you know, you see when you're the, this uh, uh, ambulance is coming, it's, the sun is on, they start flashing, so connecting. But get what? You also can find out if there is a big traffic area at a certain time of the day, I automatically adjust the traffic lights to make it more fluid, that area, and don't waste a red light there when there's nobody coming on the other side. So the city is becoming smarter. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, so they have sensors, software, it's network and connectivity, and also 
Uh, somebody of you have heard about 5G that is coming. So in Asia is already getting there. Here is uh, trying to get there. Just to get this amount of demand, having the broader bandwidth to be able to uh, support this will be necessary. So how can it help? We talk about smart cities, health improvements like a wearables. If you using your wearables or certainly all the data goes into the cloud, or you just find a private cloud. But how to help you to improve your uh, health habits? How I do it, but you exercise and sometimes to help you to monitor. Nothing like monitoring, right? If you're monitoring how much exercise you do a day, say, oh, I probably haven't done enough this week. I gotta pick up. So it gives you some feedback. Uh, supply chain optimization. You know, there, even a couple of years back, uh, pineapple from Hawaii, I'm told, they actually implemented an RFID in every pineapple, all the way from the source to the destination, to ensure and to find out where the pine that every truck was con climate control and know that all through all the process so they don't get so they don't get spoiled. So they save like a uh, twenty percent of the pineapples that were going to damage just by keeping that control. It paid off. So that is providing real time feedback on on that the supply chain. Lifestyle security, smart homes, the color. More recently in the Winter Olympics, have you guys seen any on the Winter Olympics? Have you seen, you know, well, there is a, the Dutch team, they're using uh, IoT sensors in the skates and also in the, all the, in the, all, all the uh, attire from the, from the Olympic Games. So actually measure the performance, how close to get to the eyes, and if they have to, you know, in their not perfect position, they provide, in, the coach can see that, they can provide the press of the bottom feedback and they sense it, that they have to correct that based on, on what the uh, coach is receiving in signaling, in uh, real time. They can use that during training. They cannot use it in the competition because it would be unfair for other countries. But uh, certainly they help them to improve their performance just by having the real time sensors. Now I want to talk about, for one example of a smart cities. Can you repeat that one? Yeah. <laughs> The Internet of Things is changing much about the world we live in. From the way we drive, to how we make purchases, and even how we get energy for our homes. Sophisticated sensors and chips are embedded in the physical things that surround us, each transmitting valuable data. Data that lets us better understand how these things work, and work together. But how exactly do all these devices share such large quantities of data? And how do we put that information to work? Whether we're improving the production of a factory, giving city residents real-time updates on where to park, or monitoring our personal health. It's the common Internet of Things platform that brings this diverse information together and provides the common language for the devices and apps to communicate with each other. The process starts with the devices themselves, which securely communicate with an Internet of Things platform. This platform integrates the data from many devices and applies analytics to share the most valuable data with applications that address industry-specific needs. Let's start with a simple example. A car. After taking a long road trip, Rebecca notices that her check engine light has come on. She knows that she needs to have her car looked at by a mechanic, but is not sure whether it's something minor or something that needs immediate attention. As it turns out, the sensor that triggered Rebecca's check engine light monitors the pressure in her brake line. This sensor is one of many monitoring processes throughout the car, which are constantly communicating with each other. A component in the car called the diagnostic bus gathers the data from all these sensors, then passes it to a gateway in the car. The gateway integrates and sorts the data from the sensors. This way, only the most relevant diagnostic information will be transmitted to the manufacturer's platform. But before sending this organized data, the car's gateway and platform must first register with each other and confirm a secure communication. The platform is constantly gathering and storing thousands of bits of information from Rebecca's car and hundreds of thousands of cars like hers, building an historical record in a secure database. The manufacturer has added rules and logic to the platform. So when Rebecca's car sends a signal that her brake fluid has dropped below a recommended level, the platform triggers an alert in her car. The manufacturer also uses the platform to create and manage applications that solve specific issues. In this case, the manufacturer can deploy an application on the platform called the Asset Management System. This application oversees all of their customers' cars on the road, as well as all the parts in their warehouses. It uses the data from Rebecca's car to offer her a potential appointment time to service her car, directions to the nearest certified dealer, and a coupon for the service. What's more, 
The app will ensure that Rebecca's brakes are covered under her warranty, that the correct replacement part is ordered, and then sent to the dealership so it is ready when she arrives. But the manufacturer's analysis does not stop there. They have also deployed a continuous engineering application that tracks not only Rebecca's car, but hundreds of thousands of others, looking for ways to improve the design and manufacturing process of the car itself. If the same problem in her brake line crops up in a critical number of other cars, the manufacturer uses applications custom-built for the automobile industry to pinpoint the exact problem. They can see if these cars were made at the same factory, used the same parts, or came off the assembly line on the same day. So what do all these pieces add up to? Streamlined inventory management for the dealer, a better, safer car from the manufacturer. And for Rebecca, it means she can be back on the road faster and get to where she's going safely. All thanks to the Internet of Things. Okay, so that's uh, one example of how the, all these interrelate between IoT, big data, artificial intelligence. So, another one is about vending machines. Have you seen all these new vending machines when you, you see multiple options there? But some of them, no, the ones from Coca Cola, right? Before they have cans, now they have you can different flavors. Guess what? Now, based on the demand, they can use different replenish according to the different behavior of people in different areas. Some people may like pure Coke in some areas of the city. Other people may like more like a diet Coke. Another one like a, the new flavors of Coke or whatever. But they don't gonna deploy the same amount everywhere. They based on this understanding, they replenish that. For example, and they also tell when they have to be replenished. Some of them may have to be replenished once a week, another ones maybe twice a day. So that will be in real time feedback on understanding where to optimize the supply chain. So that's, and there's another one about, that's about Coca-Cola, but it's a lot of things going on that. Have you seen those? Yeah. Wanna go back? No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Now, the other one is the market. Last year we have about a million number of uh, devices. It's going about uh, over 20 million a billion number of devices in uh, 2020. There is a number of um, money they spent today in IoT. It's going to about 1.7 trillion. There's a huge opportunity there for people to get ready and understanding how IoT works, how to program it, and actually get part of the market for that. Mm -hmm. So you are ready for that. It's a huge mm -hmm. opportunity on, on, on business for you, for you guys to understand that. Now let's go to the next page. Here you see that people, developers in Asia, about 70, 41% of them, are already doing IoT. They understand how to work. In the US, about 27. US in Canada. So I think it's a huge opportunity here for you guys to learn about IoT, get ready. It's a huge market, you can see that's 1.7 trillion. But like, who's gonna get that market? The people in Asia or people here? You wanna learn how to do that, so there's another great opportunity. So why that's why also we should bring in all these things in the Queen's College as well. Okay? Um, let's move on. So any questions about IoT? Now I want to talk about machine learning. So what is that? So we talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, but it's more about how the computers can more emulate how we work like animals or people and learn from experience. So how to be programmed. So how we get ready a computer to learn by just experience, by learning about it. So everyone knows what is an algorithm? you describe it? What is an algorithm? Just a sequence of things, for example, yeah. Like you can tell it like one thing and then it can learn from that, like you get two other things where everyone's kind of the same to learn to do that. And it just goes from there. Correct, correct, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, this is an example of the algorithm. So the, how they automatically improve those algorithms based on what they're learning. Uh, now, how it helps? Image processing and computer vision, right? For like a face recognition, now many phones can recognize that and how to make it secure. Doesn't link and my face is the same as others, but it's very and get into my phone and privacy. Motion detection, object detection, as for automotives. Computation biology, tumor detection, right? Uh, drug discovery, DNA analysis, all that. Uh, aromatic predictive maintenance, we saw an example of that. Crash detection. And there is a companies as well that do, in particular in MadWorks, uh, they have reused a lot of information about how the crash detection and, and also a lot of insurance companies, one is to prevent it, and second, to see who actually was driving, how it was driving. 
and be able to, you know, to, to provide that information. So there was a case in, in the UK, there was you know, millions of dollars on that, and based on a particular, uh, the, and these particular machines, they were able to say, okay, actually, it was not fault of that particular, right? They discovered exactly what the issue, and then who was actually saying the truth, because they had a, these devices installed in their, in their, all their company cars. So they were able to, to gain that case. Natural language processing, voice recognition, we talked already about Alexa. Uh, and they just keep learning. Huh? So keep learning about your voice, keep learning what you like, what you don't like. And maybe sometimes, you know, you like to turn on your lights every day at uh, 6 a.m. Maybe, next, you know, when they just come and turn on the lights, that's the way you like to turn it on. And they say, I'm going to start dimming them out. So what we can take most advantage of machine learning? Uh, this one is a lot of variables, and it's a lot of data out of it. So be able to learn about it. Uh, we talk about fraud detection. And you know, there's many things, you know, how uh, things start happening in very areas. You can detect that, you know, there's a virus there, or they're behaving there. Some phones start going slow in your, in your network. You can notice that it's maybe it's a virus going in many phones. Uh, predictive shopping trends. There are some companies like a Sara from, a, uh, anybody know Sara from, a, it's a Spanish brand of, a, of a women's uh, well, for men, uh, clothing. But what they do is they understand from the, in the right for the store, what people is buying. If people just, son, for whatever reason, they like their green color that came up this morning in the news or whatever, and people start buying green, or because of the change of weather, they immediately they stop the line and say, oh, well, guys, stop producing red. Let's start producing green now, because they, that's what is changing the trend. So they, they you know, stop the production right away. So that helps you to that pre predicting, and it's, it's not really predicting. You're under, understanding the market and be able to fix that on the fly versus producing things that end up being on sale because, you know, nobody finds it. Face recognition, how it works. So a frame, face detection, it's just a simple diagram, how uh, uh, face recognition works, certain algorithms and modeling behind it. Okay. That's it about, it was very simple about uh, machine learning. Any comments or questions on that? When I move about blockchain, so uh, some people say, uh, to hear about blockchain, right? So, some examples of blockchain? So it runs all the cryptocurrencies. Yeah, mm. yeah it's the most common one. Yeah. And cryptocurrencies is one of the most common ones. We're going to talk about other ones, and lastly, we're going to talk about cryptocurrencies. Yeah, so a lot of people know about it. How this works? So today, you know that uh, there's a lot of cybersecurity issues, right? So companies are doing a lot of cybersecurity investment. You want to ensure that your uh, debt is not stolen, your uh, credit card is not stolen, all that, right? But now, at the end, if somebody penetrates your uh, computer, find your password or your phone, everybody can get all your data, right? What happens with blockchain? You put that transaction, you, you encrypt it, but then you store that like, in thousands of computers. The same data. It's encrypted. Nobody else can read it but you. But when you do another transaction, it links to the previous one, and before decrypting it, it checks, okay, does this match with all the other com copies that are there in the, all these computers? It doesn't, that means that somebody hacked this computer, but it wasn't able to hack all the others at the same time. Because it's, it's kind of, you have to hack one, you have to hack like a thousands of them in the same instant. If you do that like a two seconds later, too late, so we're not able to hack it. So that protects that. So that's like one of the big power of this one, will be that, that's one of the applications. So let's move on to the next page. So it's a bunch of blocks that work together. One is public, like a cryptocurrency, which everybody can run it. And get share of it, you don't, you don't get paid to the run, but you become part of the network. Another one is private, where only people that are part of that organization can access to it, like banks. They get together, but it's costly, but they say, I want to secure that. And I'm going to give some examples of that. Okay. Healthcare, for example, in healthcare, it's a lot of info situations with uh, private privacy in your healthcare, right? You don't want that some, anybody else knows about somebody who has cancer or had diabetes and all that because you want insurance pro, uh, you know insurance uh, rates go up because you want to do that all that so it's a lot of security but at the same time you want to let research organizations to learn about that so they can do better right so all the security can be achieved with a blockchain where people can access their own data and people who use this in need can access it but nobody else can decentralized exchange so everybody uh, for example, if you want to go to a bank, you want to go travel, all right, you have to pay a fee to get converted to a different currency, right? 
you pay, you know, you end up, you know, you change two euros and then switch back to two dollars, you end up losing money in both ways. With this, the idea is there is no intermediate. You just change directly and then you can save that money. Mm -hmm. This is really called the storage tending we talk. Today you pay to Google or you pay uh, Microsoft to pay somebody to hold your information secure. Right? With this one, you still paying one and, then, and by the way, or you play Comcast, and then Comcast knows all about your life. You know, you went to the store, which where pages you access, what TV shows you were what looking at. But with the blockchain, you are you actually your data is not stored in one place, but in thousands of computers and pieces of it. So you bring out the information together, so that nobody else can recreate that but you. So you really have privacy in your data, and you don't pay to all, you pay a fee to a common people. Uh, smart contracts. Um, when I talk about that, many things of that is again the transactions. I don't want to too deep on this one, uh, but when you buy and purchase and sell a house, many of these people pay an insurance on the on the title because you know there are cases where somebody got a loan on that particular house and no and didn't tell that anybody, right? They just get a loan and somebody falsified that, and there are many cases on that. With this one, it will prevent that because then. Only the owner has access to that particular title, and then that's what exactly. Uh, there are several banks in uh, New York that are investing in this to save millions of dollars in title insurance, just be able to do them through blockchain. I think Vermont has started to do that as well. It's one of the counties in Vermont that start to do blockchain for us, ensure the ownership of uh, titles. Fair trade music, you know. Now, in the past. Only the large companies get uh, money, and then the singer end up getting probably 20 cents of their full disc, right? Or half or a dollar for the full disc. All this investment, and I was composing on that. Then came iTunes. Now, now they don't get one dollar; they get two dollars. Okay, that's great. They get double, but still two dollars out of that fifteen dollar, right? Now with fair trade music, the idea is that only you are purchasing directly from a owner of the content. So instead of you paying fifteen dollars for the day, for the full. Uh, CD, maybe you end up paying five dollars, but then that composer, and instead of getting uh, only two dollars, they only get probably four fifty or four seventy five. So everybody wins. You pay less, the actual producer gets you know more money. Back. So there's a lot of fair trade on that, on music, on on uh, expect to do fair trade as well on the uh, on uh, food and so on. Digital voting, we know all the situation that goes with digital voting, right? So it is not possible yet that there's all these people's complaints about fraud and all that. Well, now, in Denmark, they started in 2014 with a digital voting, you know, using this. To, to, and I think when it achieves that, so you do, cannot duplicate yourself, right? It's you and you, it's a way to very validate that. It's not like a fraud, uh, all that. So it goes, and then cryptocurrency, that's another example. I have many applications, but this is mainly applications on a, go, the next one. And the cryptocurrency is a bunch of different coins that you can buy. You know, there's one coin that uh, 20, three years back was costing eight dollars. In December, it picked up to nineteen thousand dollars. It's back down to eleven hundred. No, no, should you know? It's go up and down still, but eventually, you know, a lot of blockchains, you know, cryptocurrencies are going there to allow exchange, and people are using uh, uh, cryptocurrency to buy stuff as well. Uh, Any comments on blockchain? I think it's a little bit one. What is one thing is, who remembers internet in 1980s? Well, probably to you guys. Huh? <laughs> so, so it was like a, you know, a little thing there, right? You know, it's very difficult. But uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And, but that time, probably nobody of us imagined that you can end up buying everything on the internet, right? It was like crazy. And you know, even in the 2000s, like, yeah, you were hesitating to buy something on the internet. Today, if you're not on the internet, you're gone. Like Amazon is coming at you. For example, there is a, like a sport city, it went away. <laughs> there is a circuit city, it went away. All these companies went away because Radio, Radio Shack didn't happen. So, so 35 years back, nobody believed that. Blockchain is the same thing. So today, very few people understand about it. 20 years from now, you know, people go, no, blockchain is going to be <laughs> out of market. Okay, maybe you have a um, robots, and those ones are we were talking about with Richard. Really, is how we put together robots and artificial intelligence. Uh, again, it's a huge investment, 180 billion dollars there. It's a lot of uh, opportunities for engineering. It's a lot of opportunities there for marketing. 
Let's move to the next page, please. I'm gonna click on that. Uh, have you guys seen this paper? Robo Robo so let's see what she's all about. I'm Pepper. It's nice meeting you. Would you like to know more about me? Okay then. Let's start with these things I happen you don't. I'm a humanoid robot. My purpose is to interact with humans. To do that, I have cameras and microphones in my head. I have three wheels, but I can't jump. Most importantly, I have 17 degrees of freedom. It means that I can move like no other robots and use familiar gestures so that we can understand each other and get along. Now, touch the top of my head and I will give you my robot racing name. Awesome! I started my career in 2014 in Japan. One of my first experiences was to guide customers in Nescafe stores and help them choose coffee machines. I'm also working at Nissan in Japan. I attract more people to their showrooms. And recently, I've been helping customers in car more stores in Europe. I offer recommendations for wine, books, and recipes. Now I am ready to bring my experience to the U.S. I am just completing my training in various industries like retail, hospitality, travel and health care. Now that you've heard my resume, I'll tell you about my specialty. Touch the top of my hands so we can keep talking. As you may know, I can detect people's mood. For example, I can tell if a customer is happy or sad. This helps businesses understand how customers feel about certain products. Based on that, they can improve their in-store experience. And right now, I can see if you're smiling or not. I don't see a smile. Come on. We're having a good time here. See, there's a smile. Now, I'll tell you about my network. So, say, networks, and we'll go on. Awesome! Everybody talks about the cloud. I've never seen one. I'm an indoor robot. But of course, I am connected. The one I'm communicating with is my very own cloud service. But I can also be connected to other cloud solutions like Microsoft Azure or IBM Watson. I'm Althea Chang with Tom's Guide, and that was our demo with Pepper. If you want to learn more, you can read our article on Tom'sGuide.com. So that's about that, that cognitive uh, robot, and there's another video there that we you just can. We're gonna send this this uh, PowerPoint so you can see that later. But that uh, is more. So these robots are technology involving robots that can learn from experience, that from humans, uh, teachers as well. And um, on their own, and that's what is maybe important. They can be not only be taught, but also be learning about experiences. Uh, so this technology is very complex as well, but it's an important thing. It can be unstructured, and that's what is the advantage of it. It doesn't have to be structured because the real life is not structured yet. So that's why the value on this one. Uh, and this way, you know, there, there is a bunch of robots that you may see. If you go to the uh, MIT Museum. Uh, there is a bunch of robots that I have created, as well as in the Museum of Science. Well, you can take a look at them. Uh, and many of those are very interesting as well. Now, they, they are classified for different types. Mo um, they are motorized, they are those who know imita imitations, as well as um, knowledge acquisition. Some of them combine all these. Uh, and there are different applications as well. Let's double click on this one just to see. You can see one that's in Boston Dynamics. It's created here in the Boston area. Uh, this, is, this looks like more like a robot. But. You can see, you know, totally uneven in space, so you have to be learning how to. I mean, losing the balance, how to go back and balance. How much does that weigh? Is it about 300 pounds or something? Mm. From 
Broadly. Yeah, Broadly. Yeah. been showing is you know it's learning and it's finding the place you know it's, even you change the pattern it's going versus previously you have to be no the previous robots you have to find them where they are where things are You know how these uh, different events, this plan uh, can happen many events, but it reacts to those events and continue to uh, achieve the task it's supposed to achieve. Okay. Well, you know, that's uh, what about uh, now, so pretty much all that. Uh, any questions about cognitive robot? Well, okay. This is just all the ideas that you can see there's no limits. Uh, you can travel the world or that type of it. You know, there's many things uh, that you can do uh, as an engineer. You were talking about flying, you know. This is a still in prototype, but I mean, you remember the Back to the Future uh, yeah, I'm still movie? I'm waiting for my hoverboard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they are the ones that are starting now. So they can, it's still very low limitation, but they can do that. Self driving cars, we talk about those ones. Uh, you can click on videos on there. Let's go to the next page, please. This is a process that we already reviewed, right? Just for you to remember how to create it, how to innovate. Other areas that uh, we don't want to talk about them today, but just for you to be curious. Uh, BCI, Brain Computer Interface. And this is about how you want to control your computer without touching it, just by thinking about it. So they are still with cables, but uh, the idea is uh, they are doing that without any connection. So you can think about it, and there's as well a video behind it that you can learn you have just by thinking about something, you can answer questions, and you can actually make things happen. Working on a lot of that with uh, um, prosthetics now, too. Yes, and this is exactly this one as well. You know, how you, you just by sending some signals to a muscle, it knows it means it finds out that your brain means to open or close the hand and the pressure you want to apply on it. Yes, exactly that. And it's a huge, you know, it's a huge opportunity there as well. Quantum computing, you know, it's again it's going to change the world when we go to quantum computing. You know, from security for everything. It's that way that speed goes and resolve things. Today, artificial intelligence. Only a few of them are available now. It's just, uh, I think the maximum has 20 qubits. You you can learn more about it. Uh, you can do cyber security topics, robotic process automation, just to improve that. So there are other topics that you may want to learn more about. Okay. Civil engineering. It's other areas of engineering, not only systems, but civil engineering, how they relate as well. Uh, and then uh, biomedical engineers. You mentioned that as well. A lot of that. Let's go to the next page, please. And so the challenges, the smart and mobile devices. Just keep clicking on that. So there are different types, many types of engineering. Okay. Many types of engineering that you can choose. And you know, things that you like, driver likes different things, but we all need all of them to make it work together. So and, uh, certainly there are many options here in Quincy College that you can be part of it. Talking about flying car, right? <laughs> okay, let's click on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, flying car. I'm 
Then I look up here, up here then. This week, the Dutch company Paul V announced the first flights of its prototype flying car. This unique vehicle is called the Paul V-1, or the personal air and land vehicle. And it marks the start of a new era. On the ground, the vehicle drives like a sports car. Within minutes, its rotor is unfolded and its tail is extended. Then it is ready to take off thanks to the advanced gyrocopter technology. With these successful test results, it's proven that it is not only possible to build a flying car, but also that it can be done within existing international rules, both flying and driving. Having passed this important milestone, the company is now inviting investors to join them in creating the future. The next step will be the design of the first commercial production model of the Paul V. And first deliveries are expected in 2014. For 100 years, people have been dreaming of a flying car, and many attempts have been made to realize this dream, but now it has truly become a reality. So there, there are 10 of them. Um, so you can see, see that video there. Then there's another one, how to self driving cars for. I mean, let's take a look at this one. This one is uh, related as well about 3D printing. We see the three printers in the back and how they have to resolve real life. pictures and got little cardboard cutouts cycling it and, and trying to figure that out and uh, so then I came up with the, the linkage system to allow that to happen. Made a couple adjustments to the shock to the dampening and brought it home and took about 10 steps over the dirt bike, fired it up and uh, just pinned it down the ditch through the modal section um, and you know within about a minute I knew I was on something and my smile was from year to year I was like holy cow I, this is this is gonna work from that moment on it's it's been a little more about how I can help other guys do it than just you know making myself out able to be out on the racetrack. So once I got the motor in the end of production, um, I started getting it out to a, a couple people, and Keith Deutsch is one of them, he's a, he's a military veteran, and uh, he's a snowboarder. I brought a demo unit for him to try out. And so I got them all set up on it, got strapped in. We get down to the bottom of the, the run, and uh, he looks over and he just gives me the biggest high five. He's like, dude, this thing is awesome. I, I haven't boarded like this since I had two good legs. So these are another examples of how you can kind of buy technology. You can buy the 3D, you know, the, you know how you biomechanics and uh, design. Yeah, and then the other ones. Here is all the web page that you can, some of these are just linked to the videos in case they didn't work. You can go from here. Some uh, interesting articles about artificial intelligence from Gardner and about the market. And this is just companies that, uh, and used for research is our company, Positive ECS, but also other companies that contributed on the content as well. Okay, so that's uh, pretty much. And comments, questions? Who's up for being an engineer? <laughs>
Thank you so much.